Hi and welcome back to a new video again C490 as a topic and we will do a short preview of the Gigabyte C490 Auros Extreme Water Force mainboard. You probably are familiar with the Water Force family already from like X299 and I think this could be the most extreme and also probably most expensive board for C490 and a socket 1200 and that's why I think it could be quite interesting to take a closer look at the board, some specific components and maybe also the water block itself. I also have a CPU luckily on the table, a 10900K. Unfortunately, as you know, we are still prior NDA when it comes to performance. That's why we cannot show any kind of performance data. Unfortunately, also no temperatures of the VRM. But we can put the CPU in the socket, which allows us to show how the board will light up, which I think will look quite cool. Starting off with a quick overview of the board when it comes to everything PCI Express related. We have three slots in total mechanically times 16. However, as you know, this platform does not offer so many PCI Express lanes. That's why they will be split up in case if you use, for example, SLI and V-Link, then you will have only times eight in the first and the second slot. Otherwise, you should use the primary slot to have times 16 lanes for PCI Express for your VGA for example. And then you can also spot multiple M.2 slots right here. And the first one is marked with M2A CPU. That's why I first thought this one would be connected towards the CPU. However, looking into the manual and shout out to Gigabyte for providing this beautiful block chart. It's always perfect if they have those kind of block charts inside the manual because then you get a perfect overview which device is sharing lanes with for example a different slot that's absolutely great to have this block chart in there and if we take a look to the right right here we see that m2a cpu and m2p pch are directly connected to the c490 chipset therefore you would not lose lanes on the cpu if you would populate the top m.2 slot and also we can see right here there is a switch which is switching M.2 slot M to MPCH with some SATA ports. Therefore, if you populate that one, you will lose some SATA connectors. So very nice work to Gigabyte for providing those block charts. Absolutely lovely to have them in the manual. If you have any more questions and you own this, then just look inside your manual and check out the block chart. That's the easiest way of understanding which slot is sharing maybe lanes with another slot. That's pretty cool. And also all the other ICs that are on here, the PCI Express splitters, for example, are already rated for PCI Express 4.0. Same goes for all the traces on this board. That means that if you later upgrade, for example, to a Rocket Lake CPU, which should feature PCI Express 4.0 then the board should also be ready for PCI Express uh, 4.0 and you should have it on your PCI Express uh, slots. When it comes to M.2 I'm not 100% sure because they should be connected to the C490 chipset and, and I'm not sure how exactly it will work with C490 if it will then switch to PCI Express 4.0 or if the DMI will stay the same and then everything on the chipset level itself will be limited to 3.0 not exactly sure at this point. If you have any more information, feel free to leave it down in the comments below. On the IO shield, we see the clear CMOS button and QFlash Plus, so you can flash your BIOS without having a CPU in a socket, just plugging your USB stick and then you can press the button and flash the BIOS. We have Wi Fi, we have 2x Ethernet, 2.5G, 10G, we have 8x USB A, 2x USB C, aka Thunderbolt, HDMI if in case you're using the internal graphics and the audio solution. I also like how Gigabyte put their focus this time really on the VRM and power delivery in general. We have 16 phases and each of those phases are providing up to 90 amps over the power stages. If you calculate that should be 1440 amps in total which is really quite a lot and it doesn't matter if you're using the Extreme or Extreme Water Force both have the same VRM design, the one is air-cooled, the other one is obviously water-cooled. Gigabyte is using doublers though, that's why we are more talking about 8 real faces, but doubled to 16 faces in total. The backside is almost completely covered in a massive backplate, only the area around the CPU is not covered, which makes sense because you might need that for installation of your CPU cooler. And in case you're wondering what this part is right here, from what I can tell, 
this should be a relay and might be a part of the audio solution. Here we have the quite massive backplate of the C490 Extreme Water Force mainboard. What's a little bit special about this backplate is that we have this bent up edge right here and those edges are giving backplates a lot of stability. Usually if you see backplates they're just flat and nothing is bent but if you have those bent edges it really gives them a lot of stability even if I put a lot of pressure on there you can hardly bend the backplate. It will give the board a lot of additional stability, which is useful, especially around the area of the chipset. That's the area where you have a lot of RMAs. If you don't have a backplate and you work with a board that's really heavy, like you have your water block installed, you bend it, it can easily snap something on the BGA area of the C490 chipset. And also we have some thermal pads on here. This one should probably be the backside of the 10G network chip. And then two very big thermal pads covering the back sides of the VRM and also the doublers. And here underneath the back plate we can find the doublers of the VRM. Always if you have those kind of ICs, very small tiny ICs behind the VRM itself, it's a very good indicator that the VRM is doubled. This is an X570 board from Aorus and I'm just filming the back side of the memory area so you can see all those pins coming from the memory slots. Switching over to C490 very clean and you cannot see any pins. The reason for this very clean design is that they use SMT DIMM slots which are just mounted on top of the front side of the PCB and I saw this before and I'm trying to remember which board it was. I think it was also a Gigabyte board. I think it was C97, a special LN2 board that never made it uh, to the market as far as I remember. If you know which board I'm talking about and you know it, maybe just leave it down in the comments. I'm really trying to remember. But the positive aspect certainly for Allen 2 is that you cannot have any kind of short circuits. You don't really have to protect this area right here. You don't have all those open and naked pins. Cannot cause any short circuits. For normal ambient usage, it also has a benefit that the PCB manufacturer can place an additional ground layer on top, which should give you additional shielding for the memory traces. Therefore, signal quality should be a little bit better than the typical dip mounting. First a quick look on the back side of the water block. Everything is pre-installed which is something I really appreciate. We have a lot of thermal pads right here to cover all inductors, power stages and obviously also the M.2 slots and the chipset. Everything covered with foil on the thermal pads. Just remove and peel off the foil. Then you can install the block, everything is ready to go. Even a thermal paste is already pre-applied for the CPU. The block is made fully out of copper and nickel plated, means you could also use liquid metal if you want to. The only part which is made of aluminium is the part here on the right, which is covering the M.2 slot. But since there is no water directly flowing through this part, it doesn't matter and is also perfectly fine. All right, installed. Let's turn it on and see how it looks like. A white debug code LED, that's beautiful. On this board RGB is not that extremely present, which is something I like. It's not that shiny, therefore a little bit more elegant. Makes it look really, really high quality. So much about the C490X Extreme Water Force from Aoros. That was just a quick overview. Obviously, when we get the permission to actually test CPUs, we will do some VRM temperature testing, also chipset temperature testing, and everything in this regard. If you have any questions, anything that you're missing, something you want to see in addition, please just let me know in the comments down below, and then we will do it in the second video. Thanks for joining in, and see you next time.